Okay, today is... Wednesday, is it? The 28th of December, 2011. And I am here with Richard Lazell and Richard Hicks. And we are going to conduct this interview about the time that Richard Lazell was... Well, visionaire was the word that you came up with eventually. We'll talk a little bit about why that was at AIT. Before we get into the, the first question, do you want to just say a little bit about who you are? So, Richard Lazell first. Hello, I'm Richard Lazell and I'm an artist with a wide range of different aspects to my practice, I would say. That is true. And Richard Hicks. Uh, I'm Richard Hicks. I guess uh, I'm a businessman. Um, the core of my career, the big part of it was to create a software company over 20 years from a standing start with uh, £10,000 I'd saved up, my brother and two friends and over 20, nearly 20 years built it into an international PLC. Okay. Now, how did you two first meet? Um, we met on a Greek island called Skyros where so, I was... So romantic, Richard. <laughs> we met on a Greek island. I was, Let's leave it at that, shall we, then? Well, I, was, I think it was, why it's interesting is that I was working, really, as a facilitator. And the centre, which is called Atsitsa in, on this Greek island, is like a holistic workshop centre. It's also a holiday. <coughs> so people go there to relax, but also to have life-changing, potentially life-changing experiences. And... Um, I'm the course director when I'm there, so there are different course directors throughout the season and I'm usually there for a month or two weeks or something. And in the role of course director, it's um, one of the intentions is to build up a strong sense of community and various strategies have been developed over time to make this effective. And I think the fact that Richard came to, to take part in this program at a kind of in, interesting time in his life meant that we began a dialogue that perhaps wouldn't have happened ordinarily. So, Richard, looking back to that time, Richard Hicks, you, you, what, how did you, why did you go to this Greek island and do this course? What, what is it that you remember about that? Um, I, well, I didn't go. Uh, with any expectation to learn anything useful for my business and I don't think I went with any expectation of a life-changing um, uh, experience. I, I went because I was single and it sounded interesting and The Guardian rated it highly. It was a good holiday for singles and uh, yeah, and that's why I went on it as an interesting holiday. I really didn't know how it would become relevant and uh, it was only probably in the second. It's it's run over two weeks. Uh, it's and just a little more, add a little more. That in the you, everybody arrives. I don't know how many people arrive at the same time as me, but a group arrives about sixty would be a typical number, and you all arrive together and you leave at the same time, and so you you share this experience over two weeks, uh, and it is and to it by the middle of the second week, I guess. I'd started to recognise in what was going on something I thought was very relevant to me because the holiday, um, the, the process, the holiday, we'll call it a holiday, it is a holiday, no question, uh, the process you went through, there were very particular structures where I, which I recognised were, be, were being were being devised and, were, and so on were to create relationships and community and that resonated with me about what I was trying to do in my company which at that time, I think, uh, I'm not sure, but I think was probably 100 people. I don't remember, I'd have to date it, but it, it wasn't as big as it got, but it was big enough. I mean, my it was getting beyond what uh, my friend David Cannon would call a sort of family-sized business, family or it's getting to a township model, he calls it, when the relationships and roles in it of a particular type. And towards the end of the um, holiday, um, I met up with Richard and I said, I'm, in so many words, I'm not quite sure how mm. this could work, but when we get back to Britain, would you like to come along and let's talk about how we can apply what's going on in Atsitsa, Skiros, mm. to 
our company. And I, I remember been... thinking at the time, oh, I have this has happened before. You mm. know, people have a have a. Oh, they're in holiday well, mode. I've never admitted this scepticism well, yeah. before. <laughs> people are in holiday mode. Interesting. And they think, oh yeah, maybe there's somewhere I could use this. And I thought, well, that's very nice. And we'd had quite a bit of contacts. I think that there'd mm. been. I thought we were both called Richard, both Piscean. Yeah, there were quite there were quite a few coincidences. And your dog had died, and I hadn't got one yet. Yeah, and I'm spurious. <laughs> the so we had had contact, but I did think, oh well, I wonder if I'll hear from Richard. I genuinely thought I wonder if I'll hear from him. So that thing had happened quite a lot. I mean, I I don't need you to go into massive detail about what happens on in in Greece. No, no. But, but that thing had happened quite a lot, where well, people not, fed not, not, not so a lot, a bit. A bit. Okay. I mean, Richard was relatively unusual in that he was a businessman. We didn't get so many business people. There were more people who were working in health or teaching or something uh-huh. like that. So, um, well, when then I did get the call from Richard. And at the time, I was on the board of O&I, the management committee of O&I, which was the, the, the successor to the artist placement group. This was Barbara Stavina's project. Barbara and John were trying to revive O&I and I'd been on the board for a couple of years and not really, nothing had really kicked off. You know, we'd been to meetings with BT and, and nothing had really happened. So I was quite sort of interested in the whole idea of working industry. And I, my, my, in my mind, when I went to that meeting with Richard in Henley-on-Thames, I thought, well, he probably wants, would like me to come in and run a a lunchtime workshop or something. But what would be more, more interesting for me in terms of the, the O&I model or the artist placement group model would be to make this an ongoing thing, make it more like a residency and see where it might go. So unusually for me, I went along with an agenda and I thought this is what I would like, I'll say what I'd like, rather than try to negotiate what might be in, in Richard's mind. And what was in your mind, Richard Hicks, when... You, so you'd got back to the UK from this holiday. Something had happened where you thought, all right, you'd, you'd initially started, in your own words, to go and, and have a holiday and maybe meet someone and, and have some kind of experience, but you weren't, hadn't got any great expectations about that. But then you got back to the UK and you thought, well, maybe there is something in this that I can apply to my business. No, I, 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 I decided, I, the meeting with Richard, inviting him to come back, and meet, and meet with me was when I was still there. So, you know, the, the inspiration to invite him happened during the two weeks, towards the end of the two weeks. Um, I, um, I, I'm not, I'm not really, sh- I'm not sure. I'm the, it, it's hard to remember precisely what, but I, um, I, 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 re- I recall, I recall, I recall what, what, one or two, th- one or two things. There's a sort of, um, with a, a a, a basic notion I had that the company was getting larger and I had a sort of um, touchstone idea that um, to remember what made it great when it was small, you know, I mean, because most, lots of companies start small and there are all sorts of good things about them, everything from sharing the same jokes to not paying for the Christmas party and all manner of things, you know, the intimacy of that. And I and I thought, well, this is a group of 60 people here and that, and a very bonded community is created. So, so in some ways, I think Richard probably might need to say a little bit more about what the Skiros process is, because it did, does create... The, the end product of that two weeks, you know, is uh, really quite powerful. And people enjoy the holiday, not so much because they've laid in the sun and they've uh, uh, gone on a creative writing course or yoga twice a day, whatever. It's because at the end of the day, they've got lots of friends and they feel very connected to this group. You know, this, that's what's powerful about it. And I thought that's the sort of thing which could interest me. But the other thing is, I mean, I'm, uh, I think that uh, you know, entrepreneurs should be more like it's more like cookery and chemistry. You know, you've got to find the right ingredients often to make things work, not. Uh, Follow some rule book, or you know, be too form- formulaic. And I, and my my um, leadership style, I suppose, was very much that was um, very much about creating something that worked. You know, and I, I, w- I wouldn't describe myself as the figurehead, but I was. I tried to avoid too many direct operational sort of roles for myself, and I was constantly trying to create something that was very healthy and vibrant and energized and so on. You know, and uh, and 
perhaps later we'd go on, we could discuss about in the fullness of time what became highly energised and healthy about it and caused it to win, come third in the Sunday Times Best Companies Work or whatever it was we did a few years in, you know. So we've got to sort of take it through those stages perhaps. All right, well, let's take it in those stages. What yeah. year was this that you went to <coughs> Skiros? Oh, I'm buggered if I can remember. Say that again. What year was this? Oh, um, it was, I know the year, it was 1995. Okay, so 1995. Mm. And let, let's follow on from Richard Hicks's um, uh, call, as it were, and say a little bit about what happens on Secure Stone, because it does sound like it was important. Mm. What, what are you trying well, to do? Well, I guess, you know, what's interesting, I still go there. And I asked myself, I mean, I, the pay is appalling. You know, it's, it's just legendary. But the, the benefits... That wasn't something I was trying to make. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but the, the benefits are enormous. Now, now, what are those benefits to me? Why do I keep going? And uh, I think it's only just the last couple of years recognised that, f- for me, I see it as my practice. It really, is like... The whole thing for me is like an artwork from beginning to end. It's like I'm facilitating a process... But when it works well, it's transformative and is um, imaginative, uh, surprising, funny, um, insightful, highly experiential. So I don't declare all that because it sounds too you know, highfalutin and irrelevant to people. And I, you know, if they want to talk to me about it, I... I, I I, I, well, they don't need, need to know that, but the, this process that Richard's described doesn't end until people leave on the plane, really. So it's like a kind of a journey that is partly about the individual, partly about the group. So is it, how is it advertised? What is it, I mean, what... Badly. <laughs> it's advertised badly as a kind of alternative holiday. It's sort of... Okay. It's it's um, so uh, an alternative holiday, but with <clears throat> some kind of group activities. But that's not yeah. It, you wouldn't. You, the whole thing about it is you you can't really tell from any of the publicity what it's really like. It's impossible to describe mm-hmm. right, really. Right. So I mean, it's it's a sheer. I mean, I, 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 oh, forgive me. I didn't want to suggest that mm. that I was uh, in the, what I saw myself doing was transplanting that process into my company, but. The point, the point I was making there was, was like, I don't think we actually said that. To, the, the short, the short form answer is, it's, I'm, it's very sophisticated and complicated, but it's a shared experience. I mean, there's a shared experience of sixty people over two weeks and a journey from beginning to end, and and there were uh, elements in that which I identified as being having potential. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, and I could have. Uh, that's the floor. That's the phone buzzing. Or, sorry, I'm not there were, there were elements in it which I ident- identified as having potential, but actually, or what um, perhaps picking up on what Richard said, what what, Ri- what Richard brought was then a rather fuller range of his practice, I suppose, into the company, which flourished, you know, which sort of flourished in, in different ways. Okay, so and I, I could so after all, I mean, I didn't I didn't discover Richard's practice or learn all about his practice. I mean. What I saw in particular was 60 people starting as strangers and ending up as friends. And I thought that's, that's a very pleasant experience. But what I saw was shared, shared workplace responsibilities, of doing the cooking and various things. I saw dividing, dividing uh, the group into smaller groups and group names. It was ECOS, is that right? ECOS it means family. So the, the, the whole... 60 were broken up randomly into smaller groups and they, you could meet, you know, so crazy small groups. So there was a daily uh, post-breakfast ritual, if you like, called Demos, where it was shared, shared information, giving and so on. Yeah. And then a structure in the day where you were signing up to lots of courses. So you, you developed, you know, relationships. You know, one person, I think um, Richard said I was unusual to be a businessman. I was basically a pretty straight sort of guy to be going on this. Most of the other people were a lot more hip than I was, I think, who, who were arriving on this thing. 
you know. Well, but you, I'm more, you, you say you know, that. Well, but, to, visually, but, but you, did, you did an exercise spontaneously in the, in the halfway meeting that, that I thought was absolutely brilliant. And it sounds simple, but you probably don't even remember doing it. But you, mm. there we were meeting in this circle for, mm. the, for the midway meeting of everybody. And you started arranging people in terms of the, the colours that they were wearing. So we had mm. this sort of, and no one had ever done that before. So you may have thought you were straight, but I could see you were actually imaginative That's too. That's very kind of you. <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, well, anyway, that's um, nice. But um, so there were, there were elements of it which I, I thought, okay, well, that seemed to be what I was struggling with, that we're now 60, and we're growing really quickly, you know, and, uh, and I suppose, uh, I think, I'm not sure if I... It's, it's difficult for me to put these things back in sequence because everything moved along at a huge pace. But I, I, rem I remember thinking at one point, one of my biggest problems at the moment is we've got a great, energised, exciting company doing amazing things and we're having to recruit people so fast. As an we'll just wash it away, you know, the, the culture of the company, the ethos, the, the energy of it will just be washed away by the number of new people joining. Yeah? So there was a considered approach to that too, really. Okay, so you come away from Skiros, you've called, you've made this proposition to Richard within the time that you were there, but you had a meeting at some time, at Henley on Thames, and Richard, you said that you went with some kind of agenda. Mm. At that point, Richard Hicks, did you have an agenda at that point, or were you like, I just want to see what could happen, or did you have a sense of what you, I, I know you had a sense that there were these things that you wanted to bring to your company, but did you have a sense of what that would really mean in hard terms of how you might employ Richard Lozell? Um, no. I mean, because, I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, how, you know, you, you can't experiment without experimenting, can you? you know? And so, uh, well, if Richard's agenda was to come along and, and get something that continued so it, it wouldn't be a one-off workshop, then that was neatly fitted what I thought, which was... I don't actually know what's going to happen, but it'll only happen if he's around a bit more than once, you know. So, uh, and, you know, a hundred or more people, an artist coming in, I don't know what he was, once a day, once a fortnight or something. It was once a week. Oh, a day once a week. With, once a week. Extravagant, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a day once a week. Mm. Uh, it's not a big deal, you know. Um, it's, it's not not a hugely expensive experiment if it works. But I remember you saying, you, know, you did say to me at that first meeting, well, let's give it a couple of months and see how it goes, which, which was you as a businessman speaking. So yeah. you know, it was costing some money yeah. and you didn't want to continue this experiment if it didn't work, right. which was fair enough. And was all this broker, do you remember, at that first meeting? Yeah. So you, you, at the end of that meeting, you had one day a week for at least a few months to, to see how it would go. Right. And did you also in that meeting? Do you remember? Did you discuss money? How? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I came along with with a fee that you thought was a bit high. Did you? I, yeah, I did. What was it? I can't remember, but I know it was. I I doubled my my teaching day rate. Whatever so that was then. Something. I can't remember what you what you ended up paying me, but it was a bit less than I asked for. But it still yeah. was. It felt it felt like it was good good money. Yeah. And about half what I'd have to pay for a contract program. <laughs> 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 and what about the materials really budget or space? Or... How you yeah, we still, the the budget thing just grew very very slowly and gradually. So what? Well, it was like, well, what do you need? I didn't know what I needed. Huh. What will the cost be? I'm not sure yet. And at first, was that what kind of were you were the artist in residence? Is that yes, how it was initially? Yes, I was called the artist in residence. And did you have an office or a studio or a desk or a? Anything? I had a, I had a desk which I think was in your office or just outside your office. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Because, you know, I, I sat next to your, your PA, I think. Yeah, I think so. Who was my PA? Sarah Clements. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so... so. Well, I had several. Sorry, I can't remember. It's not I can't remember his name. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, it's just like, I like the fact that Richard can remember it, that's all. Um, so, so you, you went in there, and do you remember anything about day one? or What did you wear on day one? I remember that. Book. I remember getting <laughs> what did you on wear my own clothes. No, it was oh, so, so, so important. <laughs> what did you wear on day one? No, no, what? Well, I remember thinking, shit, I've got to get a suit. And I got on my bike, and I went to Covent Garden, 
and I bought a black suit in Jigsaw, which was never quite appropriate, but I think I've still got bits of it. Um, <laughs> well, it, it, it got a bit, got a bit moth-y. <laughs> Not bits of I suit. think I've given the jacket to, to the live art um, archive in Bristol, actually. Oh, right. So, so yeah, so I thought, well, I'd better, I'd better get a suit. Because everybody did wear suits at that point. Mm. Also, saw it as a sort of performative act to buy a suit. So it wasn't a, quite a normal suit. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I think I wore a suit on the first day. All right, so you go in on the first day, and the, the first day is just after this initial meeting. There's never been, has there been communication? No, I just turned up. And how, how do you remember roughly what, we're still in 1995, I presume. So yeah, do you remember how October, long, something like October. that. October. And how long after that first meeting did you just rock up? It would have probably been the next week, something like that. And mm-hmm. was there any contract in place or anything no. written? Nothing written at that stage, so it's just a gentleman's I don't think so. Agreement. I think, no, there's not, there was no. I mean, because as a subcontractor, you know, if we hire people, they come on, it's basically hire them to do something and they produce invoices. You wouldn't need a contract of employment. There was no formal engagement. I think one of the key things to mention here is that Richard was the ultimate boss. He was the founder of the company and the chief executive. So in a way, if it had been the head of HR employing me, it would have been much more complex because it was Richard. Mm. Um, he was a significant figure and he was the, the big boss not just any old boss so uh, there was a sense oh Rich is having one of his projects he's got this guy in and I, I think there was some antagonism and it eventually as, as it grew I, I can remember you standing up at one of the community meetings and defending me to everybody I don't know if you remember that but you said look he's here and he's staying which was the most fantastic kind of thing you could have done. I think, I think it was geeky, nerdy scepticism, not antagonism. Perhaps that's what it was. Scepticism is. Yeah. But, you know, they're sceptical about... Yeah. You know, it wasn't, you know, at the end of the day... Well, it wasn't a company full of geeks and nerds but at all. In fact, for, as I could explain more later, but, I mean, a lot of technical people... Well, maybe this is a good point to say exactly what AIT did. What, what was AIT? Um, AIT was a, a software company dealing in what is now known as CRM, Customer Relationship Management. So it's a layer of software that sits between large corporate systems and, and their, their customers generally. And our big... Uh, the, our, um, our positioning, gosh, I've done this for a while, is about <laughs> making each <laughs> making each of the points of contact with a large corporation equally intelligent and equally helpful. So uh, if you interacted with the, the company through a uh, call centre, uh, we'd, we'd have our software would support that process. If you interacted on the web, same, or in a branch, uh, assisted selling scripts and so on, things like that. So it's about information management and delivery and intelligent interfaces. And the, the company had started out with, uh, I suppose, the, the, I suppose my, the, the sort of entrepreneurial mix had started out because I saw when um, distributed computing started a uh, combination of design, uh, human factors, you know, human computer interface and so on, and technology. And we made our name in the early days by delivering that. So... Our big breakthrough project was when we um, supported Nat West in um, the flotation of British gas, or the what it, uh, public flotation, denationalisation, whatever you call it. Um, you know, when they sold British, the whole um, Tel Sid campaign. And Nat West had terminals, customer side in branches to deal in those shares. It was a huge project, and we didn't. Designed to live it, and so what? What was uh, so? What was unique about our team in that aspect was that we had graphic designers and uh, uh, ergonomic specialists as well as technicians. So we'd already got used to the idea of something more than green screen, very technical technology. So that's what we did. Big, big software company, big big uh, budget projects, sort of uh, half a million million dollar projects, license fees, and a core product. And Rich Lazell, I mean, did you know anything about AIT and that kind of 
that story that we've just heard from Richard Hicks when you went in there? I mean, what did you know about well, the I, I knew that Richard had said to me in, in Greece that he wanted AIT to be the best company in the world to work for and to work with, which I'd never heard anybody say before. And I suppose I was sort of like really impressed at that because he seemed completely genuine about it. And I was also a bit mystified about how, how could, or how, how did I fit with that? Would it be interesting to work? I think what I hadn't expected was that, that one of the key relationships for me in AIT was with Richard. That, 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 that um, I, I did have contact with you know, everybody on some level, but on a kind of strategic level, the most, some of the ideas I had, what I did, and some of the ideas seemed obvious, and he would say, well, just try it, see if it works. And a lot of those things did, did I did continue with, and they, they, they did work. But the most sort of outlandish things came in my relationship with him. So some of the strangest things were with his collaboration, actually. Like what, now that you've mentioned that, like what? Well, an early project was that, AI, that when it was at that stage of 100, they just moved into a new building. And there was this older building, which was a bit, feeling a bit left out. And... Um, <laughs> This is the country house, country house catering. This is country house catering, yeah. yeah, yeah this is quite early on. This must be in the first few months. And mm. he, why, don't, so why don't we devise... So, well, when, so, I, well, yeah, you, so, you when, so where the issue was, we started the company in Henley-on-Thames, and it's not a very big town, and we were growing fast enough to need to move offices every year or two. And um, we moved from a tiny little place to a bigger place, and then a medium-sized place, and then we got another bigger place. And the problem was that each time, uh, on, on, one, on this occasion, uh, the, the posh new place, we were keeping up the reasonably posh old place, but it was still not, you know, no longer the centre of attention. So there's a bit of whinging and grief, grieving coming through. Up the, up the channels from staff saying, why aren't we in the nice new office, you know? And um, so I sat down and I guess, well, you know, I think it was one of our first, we sat down and said, well, what can we do about that? And um, there were some ob- tri- some sort of co- obvious conventional things. I mean, like, okay, there is a there is a nice little cafe area in the new place. Let's put one in the old place and let's make let's get some company umbrellas and have hundreds of them so you never get wet walking between them. And then we thought, let's make them laugh at this. You know, well, let, it was also let, let's do an event in the old building. In the, the old the building, people in the new makes, building yeah, will yeah. feel they've missed out on. Let's let's create a sense yeah. of excitement and rumor going yeah. on yeah. that 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 will reach the new building. And it's all focused on the old building. And I think it was your, and then it was my idea, but it's to, mm. to, to have a catering company. We were trialling a catering company on so, the well, old yeah, building. That's right. So we, 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 sent an, we sent an email out saying that, um, and it was, it was under, it was, the cover was that we were doing this stuff to, about the old building, new building, and da 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 there's clearly something lacking at the old building, so they're going to try out a new catering company. We've not had a, country, a catering company before. We sent out an email saying that Country House Catering will be coming in uh, tomorrow uh, for a trial period, and we hope it's a big success, more or less. So people, people turn up at work on that day. But Country House Kitchen doesn't exist. It doesn't, no, 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 we made it up. They, yeah, were, no, just... they were all you know, out-of-work actors and people, other people I've, I've recruited for this. I think they were met. Were they met by a butler? But there was a butler on the door. Butler, yeah. <laughs> yeah greeted. The, the, the old building was a sort of nice old house place, so it was plausible. So uh, they, they were greeted by a butler. Was ter- well, when they turned up for work. Turn up yeah, for yeah. Work. And it's morning, sir. Can I get you your paper? What paper would you like? like to yeah. And then there was a, a maid uh, who was touring around asking if they'd like tea at the desk. Yeah, and then the, the, the drama was that she, the waitress, Maid woman was incompetent and uh, but very, very willing. I mean, willing, willing. Well, I think 
I'm not sure. I mean, everybody loved her, didn't they? That was the, that yeah, they loved her, very, but she was very really, likely. very good. And so and she, then, she, she would deliberately fuck up, you know. I mean, she'd put yeah. her thumbs in cakes and things like that. So <laughs> people would sort of notice, but because she was so nice, they wouldn't say anything. Yeah. And then her boss arrives, and her boss notices Alison this. Goldie. No, it wasn't Alison Goldie. Was it? No, it was somebody no? else. Alison Goldie did the community meeting. Oh, Alison. That was another one. Alison. Yeah. Probably. So her boss turns up, who became quite a famous actress, I've forgotten her name, Vanessa or something. She she turned up and she said, they have a big... Sp- you know, so what her boss turns doing? up, you know, we're, we're her boss turns up as a power dress sort of yeah. regional manager, rather strict, and starts tearing into the maid. Yeah. yeah, and so there's a big argument, noisy enough to upset the staff. In the car park, in view in, of... That's right, the, that's right. You know, so... You can imagine, so they, they, they've started the day, they've got a butler, and they, the great thing about this, I, I'm not, I can't believe how often people would believe these things were real, you know, and that's what stands me. Nobody I think thought that, the mm. butler can't, you know, a butler, you know, and the maid, you know, they loved it. But then... The, it, it was all revealed that we had a meal over there for everybody in the evening. We had a drinks reception or something. Mm. And, the, and the new building all came over to the old building mm. for that. And the, that, uh, there it was all revealed what had really been happening. That, that, that but I was getting emails, sort of, uh, you know, straight to me saying, I thought the maid was doing okay. <laughs> like, can't we hire her directly and... That awful woman, don't let her on our site again, you know, and stuff like that. It's great. That sounds, let, let's take that as an example. So that that yeah. sounds ex- incredibly entertaining, yeah. and what, why would that be good for a business? What, as a businessman, why, why is, what is the business case for that? He's laughing. I mean, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um... One of my okay, go, um, one of the notions I had in my head was that if the company was a great place to work, then um, I imagined that if one of my people was sat around the dinner table uh, talking to their friends, and somebody said, "Where do you work?" I said, "I work. I work for AIT." Then I wanted them to be proud of that. I wanted the other person to have heard of the company and know it's a great place, and I wanted them to have a story to tell. I wanted, you know, I wanted I had the idea of sort of myth and legend, you know, sort of, I'd, I'd like like the idea that there'd be crazy things or amazing things, yeah. Uh, and this was under the heading of crazy things, <laughs> yeah. So it was it was to to do that. It was to um, break the stereotype of what a workplace should be like. And it's quite a little while ago now. I mean, a lot a lot of other companies, you know, a lot, a lot has happened in, in sort of people's um, ideas of what you know, good company culture is, you know, St. Luke's has happened, and all that, you know, lots of different uh, things. But uh, I think we were sort of ahead of the game a bit in, in, in just trying to blow that up a bit, you know, just, just um, disinvent the stereotype. Yeah, you know, actually, I mean, I haven't really thought about it for a long time, but I, uh, if you want to create um, a great place to work, then what you've got to avoid I think is having people especially young people come in because we were employing an awful lot of young people bring their own stereotype in and just reinvent it because it probably was a very bad one so you know there's an active there's an active process of um dis- disinventing that you know and blowing that up and then and then actively creating new paradigm you know a new model for them to uh, subscribe to I think one of the so, yeah, just just show, you know perturbation or something was part of it too. I think one of the interesting things, the changes that happened to me over the period because I was there for some years and how long exactly? Um, uh, seven. So nineteen ninety five to two thousand and two. Yeah, yeah. So by two thousand and two, I was working three days a week, and I had a, a team working with me. And so I was established. And so the, what Rich has described is young, young graduates coming in to a company of five, six hundred people where I was part of the organisation. They accepted that as being, oh, well, this is what it's like to be, to be working for a company. And then they talked to their friends in other companies and finally they didn't have anybody like me there. And the kind of things that were happening didn't happen. 
but the whole sense of, of un, any sort of the sense that I had early on of them being a bit of unsettlement around me changed to well this is how it is doesn't everybody have this and though the, the, the graduate recruits became some of my you know closest allies really because I guess in some ways it linked to university on some level that, that, that it was kind of had a sort of freedom to and a, a sort of openness on one thing I'd probably just say that the, the the uh, company's growth was largely fueled by graduate recruitment. At the time, you couldn't um, recruit a computer science graduate for love nor money because there's a very big growth period in technology companies. And uh, I, I, we designed a graduate recruitment program which um, uh, pivoted on two things. One, there's no direct correlation between having a computer science degree and being good at programming, good at writing system software. Um, a lot of people who get computer science degrees are really very bad at it. And uh, sort of conversely, um, there is a very negative correlation between being a computer science graduate and any social skills. I mean, that sounds a terrible damnation of, you know, but they're not. Generally, people who choose computer science are very frequently slightly introverted, not social, and so on. And so we, and from this, we discovered that uh, we, we invented a, uh, a recruitment program where we got um, tons of applications from people who couldn't get the job, like archaeology degree <laughs> graduates and so on, um, selected them for their um, social and other um, organisational skills, gave them a, um, a programming test, found the ones who were brilliant at programming, and suddenly we got this huge supply of very bright, very interesting very diverse young people um, who fueled the growth of the company. So, the, so yeah, that, I mean that's, so we probably had, you could argue, a slightly better raw material than if you went into a regular IT company, in a way. You know, the people we were selecting were interesting people, weren't they? You know, very interesting. But, but, yeah. but by choice, you know, because in a modern uh, systems company, You've got to be able to do something very technical, but you've got to do something very social too. You're meeting a lot of people, figuring out what they want, and persuading them sometimes to do it your way, sort of thing. You know, it's, mm. a, it's quite a social job. So um, that probably helped the process in a way. But so there's this sense that we're inventing a company the way we want it, you know, and they were supporting that. I think. So, I, so, so, so my prejudices about business, which had been huge. Um, and I satirised businessmen in some of my early, earlier work, were, here I was now, working in a commercial company. I wasn't receiving any public funding at all. And I, I didn't want public funding. I thought, I'm being paid well enough here. This is a real challenge to me individually. And um, these people are actually interesting, bright, and it's kind of like things are possible here that I didn't think would be possible. Well, let's talk about that. I'm really interested to focus on that for a, for a second and to think about you as an artist and your practice. And in a way, Richard, what Richard Hicks has said about what he wants to achieve is quite clear. I mean, in terms of he wants this to make this the most interesting company in the world to work for, a kind of ambitious aim, and he wants a kind of cohesive community of people that will um, talk about how great AIT is. Mm -hmm. Now, you're an artist. Did you, did you make that your agenda? I mean, did that become your agenda? Did you, or did, you, did you see any conflict between that agenda that Richard Hicks was employing you for and your kind of work as an artist? Or did... Well, you how how do you respond to that? I mean, what what was happening to your practice in that space? Well, it went through uh, over those seven years. It went through as I went from one day a week to three days a week. I mean, I I refused to go full time, which I think is probably significant. That I I want I I felt like I needed something outside of that work. I mean, I continued to show work and. Um, outside of that context and to be an active practitioner in the art world. But 
I would say that the conflict did um, increase as time went on to the point where <clears throat> I felt like the visionaire role, which I didn't, the word visionaire I invented because in, the, in that particular business context, people could not make sense of an artist in residence. They thought, well, what it, so are you making drawings here? And I, I just got sick of this, so I'd made up this, this word that then suddenly people seemed to get. It was just really, I mean, it was a joke name. But they said, oh yeah, you're visionary, yeah, you're, 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 that, you're that guy, yeah, yeah, oh, I, I know, I remember. And, uh, you know, other companies wanted a visionary. I mean, it was just hilarious, but also interesting. So I, I was a self-styled creative whatever, and... Um, it was imaginatively challenging, creatively challenging. And I felt like it had pretty much become more of my practice than the public artwork I was working on or the performance I was designing. So I don't know if the... I was aware that, that I felt like, well, I don't know of anyone else who's... I don't know anyone else who's quite done this before in this way. So I'm going to stay with it for the time being and see where I, where I go with this because I felt like I was learning a lot. I felt like this was these were transferable things that I was developing and that suddenly I was being acknowledged for skills that I didn't know I had. That, that within, at that time in the art world, I suppose, you, um, there was a sense of what an artist was, I guess. And suddenly I was doing something different. And I, I was aware that I felt I was doing this for other people as well as me. I thought, well, if I can make this happen, other people can. And maybe it's an interesting route for people that is out of the, the commercial art market. There's, there's another route through here that is partly to do with um, being strategic, acknowledging your transferable skills, um, using the skills that, that one has developed as an artist, but using them slightly, maybe slightly differently. So an example would be, I went to the first um, monthly community, they're called comms meetings, communications meeting. And I, I went to this thing and there was a lot of talking, a lot of PowerPoints, it seemed quite dry. And the venue wasn't quite right, the acoustics weren't perfect. So I, I started to think, well, maybe this could be more interesting. It could be in a different, perhaps each meeting could be in a different place. Maybe there could be... Um, a different range of things that happen during the meeting that make it less of a meeting, more of an event. And gradually they became something that I, I directed. So that although the meetings got bigger, I was the person who was um, designing those meetings and making sure that there was a balance of um, engagement with the audience on different levels, as if it was a performance, really, or as if I was designing, directing a performance piece. Now, they weren't performances, but there were elements in that so and um, they had a life of their own I could say so that would be one example and so to make those meetings more effective and more dynamic was useful for the company of course and also created again these stories that Rich is talking about so what happened at the community meeting oh I didn't go what did the communication meeting oh right oh did that happen right okay and I would find a way of kind of elevating people in the company who, who wouldn't normally be seen publicly like the mini the minibus driver was a, a, a um, he'd had a, I think he'd had a breakdown. He was a, he he wasn't normally a minibus driver. He was sort of getting back on his feet, and he liked he was a bit of a, com a comedian. So I got him to tell tell some jokes at one comms meeting, and everybody saw him completely differently. And he his standing went up, and he felt better about being there, and so on. So on that level, I was trying to looking after the whole community and trying to to not make it to, to, to break down the pyramid, which, although it was a very flat structure, there's always people who are aware of some kind of pecking order, but to, if, if one's looking after a whole community, then that's the kind of thing that, that you would do. And did, did you think in that that you could push your art practice, that you could grow as an artist, or were you focusing on the instrumentalisation of the things that you already knew, in other words, to have the effect that Richard Hicks was after? Well, I was really interested in the challenge. So to, to apply some of the, these ways of working with community that, that I had experience of 
to, on an ongoing basis, to a community that I then became part of. So I think one of the confusions for me was I became unbelievably loyal to that community. And uh, I eventually joined the company. I wanted, I felt like I, would, I stopped, I wanted to stop being a contractor. So to, so um, I don't know if that was a conflict, but it was a change. Um, what was the question again? The question was about whether or not you felt artistically you grew, or whether or not mm. you could, you were just kind of going along, if you like, with not going along is the wrong word, the right word. You you said you saw it as a challenge. What I'm interested to know is in terms of art, for art's sake, if you like, I don't even I don't believe in that phrase, but in terms of your artistic mm. growth, was that also pushed through that? Did you develop new ways of working? I definitely did, and I'm still using those that I, from that time. I'm still sort of... I, I was aware that a lot was happening. I, I, I wasn't sure. And then one, the one thing I think... One, one of my regrets is that I didn't document it very well. So I don't remember some of the things that happened, and there's very little record of some of them. Um, but I do remember a lot of it, and um, so... There are many, many things that, that I've built on subsequently mm. and brought, brought back into the, into the art world. And Richard Hicks, did all this work? I mean, did it prove itself? Did you achieve what you wanted to achieve with this? Um, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Well, definitely so. I mean, um, I mean for, for you to, to sustain it, for, a, for you to keep going for seven years, something must have been going well, something must have been right, or you must have thought there was something in it. Well, okay, at one level I enjoyed it, obviously. I mean, it was always uh, energising, uh, always made it feel exciting, uh, and it facilitated change. Uh, yes, it, yes, it, I mean, it, it most uh, um well, going back to my, did, did it give people something to talk about? Yes, certainly so. Did people accept it? Yes. Did we, as a, um, you know, in a pretty tough industry, uh, get to be the best company in the UK to work for? You know, we, we did really well at that. Um, the whole recruitment process um, snowballed along. Everybody went, people, and... I don't know, three, three years into that period, we'd get unsolicited applications for employment from senior people too. I mean, there was a very good HR director who wrote to us saying she'd heard about what we were doing and really liked what to come work for us. We needed somebody. So yeah, it did, very much so. I mean, I suppose there is <laughs> like a terrible expression about marketing. Everybody knows that half it works, but nobody knows which half, you know, it's sort of... Um, I'm not sure what all, exactly how all of it worked in what, which way, but you know what? When do you know that? You know. Um, but it sounds like you, ha you have to. And again, you know, I would remind you, it's it's more like cookery than chemistry. You you have to have the right ingredients sometimes to make the right things happen, and you can't prescribe exactly what will happen, and you have to um, have you know trust that. You know. I don't. Know, I mean, uh, you know, the last the, the, the reverse question was. Did I did ever a couple of weeks go by thinking, well, waste of money. <laughs> I wish that wish that guy Lazell wasn't here. You know, could do an out and all those bloody meetings. So, but no, I mean, it was always very positive and always adding things. You know, which I think would demonstrate that. And I could probably say that about almost an awful lot of other people in the company. Oh, I wish I didn't have to have that meeting. Sort of thing. I wish that didn't happen. No, it was always, you know. So it was very much. Um, a very important ingredient which worked in different ways. So it sounds like at the very least, I mean, at the very least, you'd created a company that you wanted to work for, that your own company was a company. Oh, absolutely. Well, that, that was my motivation. I mean, I, my, um, I remember somebody telling me that the standard profile of a self-employed entrepreneur is that um, your father was a market trader and you left school at 17. Well, my father was a local government officer, ultimately a respectable sort of chap, and I didn't start my own company until I was 30-something, you know. Uh, yeah, and my... Sorry, I can't remember the question now. The question was, um, 
and I, I, I left corporate employment because I didn't fancy my boss's job anymore. It all looked really boring, you know, and, and I worked some very big, some very good, large uh, corporations, I worked for 3M and BMW, and I thought, oh, this is really boring. They're great companies, but it looks awful. You know, and I was moving away from doing the job to managing the job, and I thought, the only way I'm going to have anywhere really great to work is to make one myself, more or less. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank you both very much for coming together and sharing that story. It's a very inspirational one. So Richard Hicks and Richard Lozell, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a biscuit now? Yes. (laughs)